What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE Fantasy Football. My name is Nicholas. I'm joined today by at FB God Noah on Twitter. He's quickly closing in on a thousand followers. And listen, this was a goal when we hit July. I said by July 17th, we're gonna get him a thousand followers. And by when you hear this recording, he might have already hit it. But if he didn't, you go follow him and you will be entered into a chance to win the draft guide, the big dogs got to eat draft guide, which has everything you need for your 2019 fantasy football season. All you got to do, go on Twitter at FB God, follow his ass and you will be entered. We'll pick a winner in the following show. So July 23rd, we'll pick that person. Today's video, we're going to break down a few tiers within fantasy football that are very, very close in terms of the rankings within those tiers. So we're going to look at tier one of the running back position. So those top four guys that are in the elite tier, we're going to look at tier two of the wide receiver position, because I think most people would agree that D hop and Devonte Adams are in tier one. And then there's a group of about four or five guys in tier two. And then we're going to look at tier two, arguably tier three, if you have Kelsey in his own tier of tight end. So like the Hunter Henry's the Evan Ingram's and things like that. So we have an interesting breakdown of uh, some of the more controversial tiers in fantasy football this year. And I think this video will be very helpful because, you know, those kind of tiers can make or break your team if you go the wrong way as opposed to the right way because the right way in those kind of tiers give you league winning upside. So that's going to be the video today. Noah, welcome back. Let's hit that intro. All right, so what we're going to do is go through each position that I named, and we're going to give a little bit of a player analysis on all of those guys, and then probably towards the end, we will do a ranking version of them. We will both kind of have our rankings um, where we would you know, put each guy in those tiers. So we'll start off at the top running backs. We have Saquon Barkley, who is obviously you know, the most gifted running back that we've seen in, in a long time in the league. Does that translate into fantasy? Hard to tell because he's in a situation similar to David Johnson where the team around him is not great. I know everyone's excited about Kevin Zeitler coming over and the line should be improved. That is true, but listen, the line is is not the only piece of the equation. You want your running backs to be on a good team overall and have a lot of scoring opportunities. At the same time, Saquon Barkley himself is so fucking good that he just creates scoring opportunities, whether it's um, through reception, through the air, and you can't tackle him. So he's very prone to those long 40-yard touchdown runs, which we saw a lot of last year. So Yeah, last it, year, um, 11 of his 10 rushing touchdowns, I believe, came from either five yards in or 50 yards out. So he's either breaking that, big – Explain that to me, how 11 out of his 10, 10 – 10 out of 11. I'm not good with yeah. fractions. I'm not here for the math <laughs> analysis. <laughs> 10 out, of, that again? 10 out of 11 touchdowns came from either five yards in or 50 yards out. And if this is an offense who we don't expect to be in scoring situations as much, those five yard and in touchdowns won't be as um, predictive. Fruit, yeah, predictive, or there won't be as many for him to score. And those 50 yard touchdowns, as you said, he's, he's a freak athlete, as Max would say. And, you know, he's got all these testing numbers, but you can't expect the guy to score that many 50 yard touchdowns like week in, week out, year in, and year out. I know he's. He's obviously a generational talent. As much as that word is thrown around, I believe it to be true for him. But if he's scoring those touchdowns from those distances, I'm, I'm afraid that his floor is a little bit lower than many think because I don't think his touchdown upside is as high as the other guys in this tier just because the offense he's in and like how he had to score his touchdowns last year. Yeah, that's the thing. I feel like his touchdown floor is definitely a lot lower. But that that's like where in the argument lies right there. It's real, For 99% of people – repeating those kind of long runs and long touchdowns is not a thing that's going to happen year over year. I just get nervous and like Saquon Barkley was a rookie. So what if he improves? What if he's just like the all time goat and he just like, do you want okay. to fade him? If do you want to fade him on the year that he goes absolutely nuts? I know this won't be the year of his, like his elite year because eventually the giants will get good and he'll be in a good offense and that will be the year he breaks out. But I, I it's so hard to just look at this and say, Eh, I, I think he's not going to be that good because he's just so fucking good. So I don't want to fade him. But like at the same time, I don't blame anyone for looking at the situation objectively as you should have done for David Johnson last year and saying, um, I'm going to fade the position and just play it with someone safer. But of course, Saquon Barkley, just given his talent, the ceiling is so high. 
And uh, another guy whose ceiling is super high this year is Ezekiel Elliott. We've heard the news that he is no longer going to be suspended with the whole EDC thing that, that came up uh, a few weeks ago. He's good for the full 16, which gives you a lot more confidence in, in picking him. With Zeke, I think the question becomes, like, one, you know, uh, it, it, it's becoming harder and harder to fade him at the 101 because you look at just how good he was last year. His reception totals were, you know, huge yeah. compared to what we've known to see him as. Yeah, for me personally, I think that's probably his biggest question mark because we know the off-field's already cleaned up. I think for him, we saw him catch 77 balls last year. Was that an outlier or could we expect that? I think it's kind of – I think his floor is going to be around 70 catches this year because I'll put the really? splits up after Amari Cooper came in. He's on pace for 104 catches, and obviously I don't think he's going to reach that mark. But this is an offense that has a new OC, a young guy who is actually on the team backing up uh, Dak Prescott as a quarterback, even though he was like 10 years older than him as a rookie. <laughs> but um, I think he's going to have a little bit more of a forward-thinking way where they're going to use running backs out of the backfield because he's going to look around the league and see the elite backs like Alvin Kamara, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, see how these teams are using them and the value that they bring in the passing game, I could see him hitting 70 catches easily. And you think in a half PPR league, because that's kind of the, the side if I come you, from. If you, told me, if you told me right now that Zeke hits 70 catches, I wouldn't debate who the 101 is. He's the 101 in every format. No, he's already the 101 for me in standard. If you're telling me he's going to catch 70 ball, my, I mean, th that's, that's where it gets scary because we know the touchdowns are going to be there. We know the carries are going to be there. He's been extremely durable while on the field because of his workhorse size. It's just, do we see what we saw in his first and second year? I mean, he averaged like a rushing touchdown a game. So last year he was way below that average, and I think that comes back to the norm. Um, and does that get six rushing touchdowns again? Maybe. I mean, he's done it three years in a row, so maybe. But I very also consistent, think yep. <laughs> he is very consistent. That's something that, you know, you can't really expect to happen every year, but it keeps happening. But Zeke will probably be more closer to the 12 to 14 rushing touchdown range than whatever he had last year. Was it like seven or eight? In, in uh, I think he had nine total. I think he had six uh, rushing and nine or three receiving. Okay, yeah. So that's – I think the touchdowns are going to go up. If the receptions are there, then he's going to be the, the RB1 in fantasy. Um, and I do think, like, is it going to be closer to the first or second year or last year? I want to say it's in the middle just to be safe, but I, I guess I would think it's probably going to be closer to last year because the, the splits were so drastic. Once Cooper came over, like, they were throwing the ball almost seven times more per game, right? And a yeah. lot of those are going to end up going. That's that's an extra, like, two targets a game for – And they season. averaged uh, six more plays per game, and that might not sound like a lot, but that's, like, two more, like, whole three downs or whatever. That's, that's, at, least, that's at least three more touches overall for Z because yeah. he's getting all the rushing work, and if they're going 50-50 or even 60-40 – like, that's going to be two carries for Zeke, and, you know, he'll usually get one of those four extra targets. And, uh, yeah, his involvement in the passing game, if that's going to be up there, I'm all in. So if you believe that what we saw over the second half of the year last year when Cooper came and the new OC coming in, hopefully with the younger mind, we see what we saw in terms of passing play percentage. If you believe that that's the case, then Zeke should be the one-on-one because he's not only um, safer from a floor point of view because the offense is going to be good. The offensive line is back to full health, and they should be very, very, very good again. His ceiling is, uh, you know, as much as you might think it's not what Saquon Barkley is because on a pure raw talent level, they're not the same player. Zeke is very fucking good. And the ceiling is that of over 2,000 yards from scrimmage and, you know, 15 touchdowns, if, if not more. So um, yeah, Zeke he led, he, he led the league in rushing twice, uh, twice, right, like last year in his rookie year. And then also in his second year when he got suspended, he was number one in rushing yards per game. So he's, he's shown he's going to get 1,300, 1,400 yards on the ground like clockwork for the next couple of seasons as long as he's on the field, especially behind that line. I think also what, depend, like what this depends on is if um, Randall Cobb is healthy, what he can bring to the offense, just helping them move down the field a little bit more. Um, if Jason Witten can like oil up those joints and see how well he can move. But I just think if this offense, if Michael Gallup takes a step forward, this offense, if like, they improve just a little bit next year. If it takes away a little bit from Ezekiel Elliott's receiving total, I think just the uh, improved efficiency will help him get into the end zone, like you said, because if you think about it, 70 catches to 100 catches sounds like a ton. But in a half PPR setting, that's only a difference of 15 points on those receptions. It's 50 points for 100, and it's 35 for 70. And I think with three touchdowns, that's 18 points. That could be easily made up for with Zeke, who's going to probably see a lot more goal line touches. than say it's, also, it's also the yardage there, though. That's yeah. the thing. The yardage on fucking an extra 30 catches is going to be yeah, almost 300 yards, you know? I just, I just want to put a little spin on things.
I know how you work. I know how you work. <laughs> got to finesse the big facts. That's how I got this job. <laughs> facts. That's how you're going to fucking lose it, too. <laughs> All, All right. right. Let's move on to uh, another back in this tier. Christian McCaffrey. McCaffrey is probably my one-on-one in PPR just because his involvement in the passing game, right, set the record for most running back receptions in a single season last year. A monster change from – his rookie season to last year, the efficiency in terms of yards per carry, he went from like 3.7, I think 3.6 up to nearly five yards per carry. I think it was 5.1. 5.1. So he's, he's above five yards per carry. Efficiency got way better. What, what the change was, is, was his involvement overall. He was playing on, I think 95 or he played on 92% of the Carolina Panthers offensive snaps. He got 95% of the touches despite like missing a full game pretty much. Yeah. Before week 17, he had only missed 29 snaps. It's ridiculous. Yeah, which is ridiculous. And given a size, like you, you don't, you don't even have to question his durability, which is phenomenal, right? He's never really dealt with injuries. The difference too was, um, on the goal line, he got all of the goal line carries. He got all of the red zone carries. He got all the passing work down there. My concern, I guess, I think his floor is extremely high. I'm not sure if his ceiling is enough to warrant picking him over a Zeke or a Saquon because people get excited about this Panthers offense, right? We have Curtis Samuel as a, as a potential breakout candidate. We have DJ Moore who had a good rookie year and very much a potential breakout candidate. And then you have Christian McCaffrey. So it's like, this is not going to be a prolific passing offense. You know, like as much as you like Cam Newton as a fantasy quarterback, he's not going to throw the ball 600 times and someone is going to disappoint greatly in the passing game. I would put money on one, if not both of the receivers disappointing at, at a sense in terms of their value and it not being Christian McCaffrey, but it's in the range of outcomes that he might be the one that maybe he catches 80 balls instead of a hundred, a hundred plus balls. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, and that's why I say like the floor is still very much high. He's, he's still very involved in the passing game, but does he, I don't know. Like what are your thoughts on C-Mac right now? I think the improvement he showed in the running game really speaks volume to like volumes to how like good of a running back he actually is. And he doesn't necessarily need 110 uh, receptions to be in that RB1 overall conversation. And right. you look at like how they built up the offensive line this year. We touched on it earlier in the summer. Um, they bring in Matt Paradis, who's like the number two center in all of football last year. Um, they draft Greg Little. They also have Daryl Williams coming up back from injury. They legit have five really good offensive linemen. And even if Cam's shoulder's a little bit bum and um, they're not throwing the ball as much as we'd hope and he doesn't get those 100 touches, I just think with the threat of a running quarterback behind that offensive line and just what he showed last year and, you know, putting on a little bit more weight just so um, we feel a bit more secure of him, like, taking all those carries, I think he has a really high ceiling. And as you said, with those 85 – I think he has, like, an 80 to 85 catch floor. He's probably at one of the higher floors amongst these running backs, which is why I kind of feel – a little more comfortable taking him over Barkley. I'm still like struggling between those two, but I just think Barkley has a lot more question marks. And if I have the one-on-one and I'm not like a fan of Zeke um, in this hypothetical, I think I'd feel a lot more comfortable taking McCaffrey because I kind of know what I'm going to get out of him. Whereas Saquon Barkley could have a David Johnson season. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely in on uh C-Mac as the one-on-one in, in PPR. And like if they had done something in the off season, like, if they, if they were the ones that drafted Damian Harris in the third round, I'd say, okay, they were actually, you know, what they were saying about giving Chris McCaffrey a little bit less of a workload is something that would very much be in, in the reality of, of his range of outcomes. But they didn't add Damian Harris. They didn't add anyone in the early rounds or sign anyone big in for agency that is a legitimate threat to his workload. So, again, I think the floor is there. And just because he's smaller in size doesn't mean he can't take the hits because he's proven to be extremely durable. And when you have the majority of your – not majority, but a big portion of your touches come by way of air, you're much at, at, you're much less at risk of injury because you don't take the same hits. You're not getting piled on by 300-pound linemen when you're running up the middle. Um, or you are, but not when you're getting receptions, right? A lot of those times you just run out of bounds with the receptions. Or you're getting tackled by a D-back who's 100 less pounds than a defensive lineman that hits you um, running up the middle. So C-Mac, definitely a lot safer than I think um, – then he's, I guess, getting credit for and should definitely be in the one-on-one discussion. The last guy on here is Alvin Kamara. Alvin Kamara is, yeah. I like, I see a lot of people talking about how he's like the clear 104. And admittedly, I have him at the 104, but his floor as well is really fucking high, right? He's gotten 80 receptions in both years, but his touchdown totals in both years have been like ridiculous. He had 18 last year. I think maybe 14 or 15 as a rookie. 
Yeah, but, dude, like those are ridiculous numbers. And it's because like you think that Mark Ingram comes in and he's gotten a lot of work in the red zone and the goal line. I'm pretty sure Alvin Kamara had the second most goal line carries. In- well, he had 51 red zone carries. That was the second most to Gurley. And he had 13 rushes inside the five. So he's getting that volume despite Mark Ingram being like a fat ass and like being able to run into the end zone from two yards out. He's yeah, so commanding these Kamara had Kamara had 13 goal line carries. Um, so he was the fourth highest in terms of goal line carries. He was second highest number in terms of 10 zone carries. So he had 34 carries inside the 10 zone. That was while splitting with Mark Ingram. Obviously, he's going to split with Latavius Murray, but the, the amount of involvement he gets down there is crazy. And yeah, he had uh, 18 last year, 13 the year prior. And this is an offense that just fucking churns out touchdowns and they use their running back so heavily down there. So it's like, He's involved plenty, right? And he's always been efficient. He's been crazily efficient over the last couple of years. So if you're going to argue that, like, C-Mac has a, has a good floor, you can argue the same thing with Kamara, who's in arguably, probably not even arguably, probably the best offense of these four teams in the top four. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think the main, like, detractor from picking, like, Alvin Kamara or even considering him at the 101 is you think of him as being a guy who's not a bell cow and a guy who's in a timeshare. Sure, he's in a timeshare, but he's getting, like, 15-plus touches a game in an elite offense, getting those goal line touches. And yeah, they bring in Latavius Murray, who's like 6'3", 230. But Mark Ingram, in his own right, had like a really high BMI, and he was their goal line back before he showed up. And mm-hmm. he still produced on, on the goal line. They're not just going to take out Alvin Kamara in those valuable situations where if you fumble it, you're going to ride the bench for the rest of the game. Kamara have proved you, have, it. Have you seen like in the NFL, I don't know if I've ever seen a team utilize a player – as good as the Saints have utilized Kamara. Just like taking his skill set and what they've fucking got out of him production wise since he came into the league is is like unbelievable, you know? Yeah, the only guy who I think rivals that's like Trent Richardson back in his day in uh, Cleveland. No, <laughs> how, but they honest- got a, how they got a strong rookie year out of him <laughs> oh, in Cleveland. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, though, like Alvin Kamara is used as like a slot receiver, he's used on the outside, he like beats people deep. He's, like, so valuable, and he brings, like, so much efficiency to the table. And last year, even on more touches, he was still an efficient running back. And I think he finished as RB3 or 4, despite – and I think in the last week of the season, he barely played because they were just resting all their starters. He – I don't think he should be written off as the 101 just because he's not a true bell cow because he has proven to be, like, a damn good football player. And I, I always use this argument where, like, if you improve your touches, your efficiency goes down. And sometimes a really good football player on less touches is just extremely efficient. And that's exactly what Kamara is. If he sees 15 touches a game this year, I don't think it's out of the question that his ceiling is the RB1. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean, looking back at last year's touch totals, you look at it and you see like a few games with single digit carries, but he always makes up for like, dude, week three against Atlanta. Guess how many targets he had in week three? Oh, 19. I think I remember that game. Ridiculous. 20. Well, on FF today, it says 20. And he caught even better fucking passes. Like, that is the weekly ceiling that you get from a guy like Alvin Kamara. And he gives you a safe floor, but he has one of the highest weekly ceilings of any fantasy player in, in the league because of the amount of scoring opportunities that you get with New Orleans. So even if he does have games where he only touches it 11 or 12 times, like, he's still likely to score a touchdown in those games because he averages almost a touchdown a game since he's came into the NFL probably not more and I have some big facts about like his target totals in the games where he saw less than five targets this was the final score 43 to 19 um 48 to 7 31 to 17 but they were up by uh 24 to 3 at one point in the game yeah Yeah. um one game was at Baltimore which is obviously a really good run defense but he had 17 carries and I believe he scored in that game and then also in the playoffs against Philly he had less than five targets but he got 20 touches on the game so even if he's not being involved in the passing game, he's being involved overall because he's like a very important part of that offense, just um, the versatility he has. And then the only game where he wasn't like he wasn't as involved in either the running or the passing game were games where they like blew out opponents. And if Drew Brees takes a little step back, I mean, I'm not sure they can be in that many situations this year. I think they're going to actually move towards a more like running approach because they did invest in Latavius Murray. And they have an up-and-coming defense where last year they moved like a bunch of their picks to get Marcus Devonport, I think 13th overall. And with, obviously, Drew Brees getting older, I could see them running the ball, being one of the highest run percentage teams this year, and that just only helps uh, Kamara's volume. Yeah, I I remember in my quarterback rankings video, I talked about Brees, and he had, like, five good games last year, and they were all against defenses that were extremely injured. Like, Philly had no cornerbacks. Atlanta was decimated or whatever. And uh, I'm assuming a lot of Kamara's, like, low-volume games were the games that Drew Brees played really well 
they blew the teams out, and that's what it led to. And I don't think that kind of stuff will happen again this year. They will have some blowout games, obviously, or big scoring games like, you know, Tampa Bay should be pretty shitty, and um, a lot of the interdivision matchups. Yeah, and your Falcons. Be- chill. Chill. We got <laughs> our, our team's back to full health, all right? Yeah, they should be better this year, the defense at least. They're going to be fucking solid. I'm excited. I fucking can't wait for the season to start. Let's talk about – all right, so let's do our rankings right now. Um, half PPR? Yeah, we'll go half PPR. You go first. I got right now Zeke, CMC, and then Barkley, but those two are really close for me. And then I have Kamara. No, 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 you, don't, you don't get the fucking – you don't right. get that. Zeke, bullshit. CMC, Barkley, Kamara. Those are my four in order. Fuck. I'm going to go with – in my rankings right now in the draft, guide, I have Barkley at the 101, Zeke 2, C-Mac 3, Kamara 4. But I think I'm going to swap them. I think I'm going to put Zeke at the 101, Barkley – at the 102, C Mac at the 103, and uh, Kamara at the 104 right now. But they're all so close. This is such a yeah. good fucking tier of running backs, man. If you're in the top four and you get one of these guys, you're feeling pretty fucking good. Although I would say, like, if I do take one of them, and I, if, if Barkley's the one I take, I'm probably the most nervous about him because just of all the risks yeah. there. So let's move on to that second tier. Wait, I, have, I have one last question. Would you be surprised by the end of the summer if DJ kind of moves into this tier and bumps out Kamara? With the way things are trending, it, it's no, kind of- not at all. He's already the fifth overall. I remember, like in one of the fade the publics, like a month and a half ago, two months ago, one of my bold predictions was like DJ was like a top twelve pick at the time. I was like, he's going to be a consensus top five pick by the time draft start, and he's already top five. And I'm, I, I think in a lot of the Scott Fishbowl um, drafts I saw, he was picked ahead of Alvin Kamara. So no, I'm not going to be surprised. And there will be nothing but good reports coming out of Arizona this whole fucking summer. So it's going to be buzz city out there and it's just going to move all of those players up and up and up and you know what like david johnson will probably go like 102 or 103 in a lot of drafts yeah and, and suddenly uh, the 105 becomes a very good spot to draft from yeah i'm not I, I won't be doing that but um i can that's going that's going to happen fantasy like the fantasy community and the, is very easy to predict in terms of you know player movements and drafts well, yeah, people are to- very reactionary when uh preseason starts and they see one guy bust off an 80 yard run. So. What does rationary mean? Reactionary. Like they see uh, something and. I you said rationary. I was like, no. <laughs> we can make up numbers, but we can't make up words. No, sir. That could be in a different language, though. Who knows? You, you're kind of right. Um, so, <laughs> Juju, Michael Thomas, Odell. Who am I missing? Julio. Juju, Odell, Julio. Those are the four, or do we have yeah. a fifth? We have okay. four, unless you want to add in like a Mike Evans, but I don't think he's really in this. No, I'm, I'm good. Those four are my next tier after Devontae and uh, DeAndre Hopkins. So we'll start with Juju, who we know had a monster season last year. I believe 111 receptions, maybe 1,400 receiving yards, and seven touchdowns. Antonio Brown is gone. So the arguments for both sides are Antonio Brown, 169 targets, gone, which means Juju's 166 targets should see a monster increase. But now he has to play against the cornerback ones. He's going to see a lot of double coverage, um, which is going to make his efficiency go down, and he's not going to be able to handle it. What is your take on this? Are you pro-Juju? Are you reaching for Juju? Are you only taking that value? Well, of these four, he's the last one picked. But they're all within like two and a half, three and a half picks of each other right now on draft.com. I don't – do people double-team slot receivers? Because he's going to be playing the slot this year. Are you going to like – no, that's not going to happen. So I'm not double team fucking receivers and <laughs> at all about getting double teamed. Like, yes, the safety goes over the top. Juju is not a deep threat. Like he never was. He didn't, he, he had 1400 yards last year, but not off deep fucking passes. That was Antonio Brown's game. That's fine. And he always had a safety behind him, but Juju's not going to have safeties coming up and, and watching him so that he beats him deep. Cause that's not how he is as a player. He's amazing with the ball in his hands. He makes plays with the ball in his hand. That's where a lot of his yards come from that. And the fact that he's getting so much volume, 111 catches. So if you think he gets, if you think he takes fucking five of Antonio Brown's targets, he's up over 170 targets. Like, yeah, it's, so yeah. the only argument I would make is um, obviously we've talked about before, but Big Ben having the most attempts of his career last year. But as you mm-hmm. said, Antonio Brown is gone. So even if their team attempt total goes down by, <laughs> damn, Big Fats are about to come out. Uh, Don't worry about it. <laughs> even if that attempt total comes down, let's say 50 throws which is a pretty big number going to like a year where you're at like 700 attempts. It probably will. I think it'll go down from like 680 to probably it will border 600 probably. Even at that point, he's going to see 150 targets because Antonio Brown is gone and he was obviously their number one and now it's Juju Smith-Schuster. And then he's also just their alpha receiver. So 
Um, he's a guy who is extremely efficient with the ball in his hands, but he's also te- uh, top 10 in air yards. And that's a function of him getting a lot of targets and him also being used um, as a versatile weapon. And him running out of the slot, as you said, and we touched upon, he's not getting double teamed. Those narratives are fake. They're going to have Dante Moncrief and James Washington on the outside, maybe Deontay Johnson if he um, shows any sign of improvement in like the preseason and grows as a player. He's going to get those slot targets where a guy like Adam Thielen puts up 1,400 yards easily. Those big slots are extremely productive, um, predict- productive roles, especially with a quarterback who's going to throw the ball a ton. And of these four receivers, I think he's kind of got one of the higher floors because of the volume he's going to see and how efficient he's been despite seeing a ton of volume where usually guys' efficiencies go down when they're used that much. Yeah, that that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Is like, yeah, if, if the volume goes down to like 600 pass attempts, I do think Juju's like target percentage, though, is going to rise. If he was at like 24% of the team's targets last year, he's got to be at that elite like 28 to 29 because he's going to command a shitload of targets, which even if the volume comes down, the target numbers go up. But, you know, 150 targets is, is, is in range of outcomes. However, like if he gets 150, say like you lined up all four of these wide receivers, Odell, Michael Thomas, Juju, Julio, and you're like, they all get 150 targets on the year, it becomes a talent game. And I would argue that Juju is, I don't even think it's close. He's probably the least talented of these four wide receivers in his tier. So if you believe his volume is going to dip, then that's where the argument becomes a, a big argument. And you're like, he probably can't produce at the level of these guys. But I think Juju's volume is is going to be higher than most of these guys' uh, volume from. And I'm, I'm cool taking that kind of um, as like a floor on my fantasy team. Because like you said, he's great. Uh, he's like top 10 in air yards. He's top 10 in uh, contested catch rate. He's top 10 in like red zone targets. He had 29 year, last year. And Antonio Brown gives up 24 leaving the team. So he's going to see probably around 30, which is like what Devontae Adams yeah, saw last yeah, year. Yeah, I love that shit. So like, you know, he was someone who had seven touchdowns last year, but he also had seven touchdowns the year prior with half the number of targets. And we brought the stat up a lot. He got tackled inside the two yard line five separate times. All of those turned into James Conner touchdowns, rushing touchdowns. So he gets lucky and three of those five break his way. Like I think a lot was unlucky last year from his touchdown scoring percentage. And that will probably filter itself out this upcoming season. So Juju's floor is very high. Um, I would argue that his ceiling is very high too, but some of these guys have, have ridiculous ceilings. I mean, we have Julio, What's what's the argument about Julio not being the clear wide receiver three? He leads the league in yards last year. He leads the league. Um, he didn't. I don't think he led the league in receptions, but he's among like the top three in yards and receptions every year. Is he a clear wide receiver three for you, or is it like the touchdown totals kind of make you nervous about taking him there? It honestly doesn't make me nervous at all. I kind of I'm like teetering on putting him in my tier one. So you guys obviously know who I have as my number one amongst mm-hmm. these four receivers. But the thing about him is. If he doesn't score touchdowns, say next year he scores zero touchdowns the whole season, what receiver, like, where do you think his end-of-year rank is? Because me personally, I'd say, like, wide receiver 12 to 15 with zero touchdowns. Yeah, he'll, he'd will he probably be, like, 15 to 18 range because he's going to put up 100 and fucking five catches and 16 to 1,700 yards. Um, but it's just, it's just, like, fucking annoying knowing that, you know, Juju has, like, 13 touchdown upside and Odell can go off for, like, 1500 yards and and 15 touchdowns in this offense but Julio just for whatever fucking reason doesn't get it done and that like frustrates fantasy players but like you said like the touchdown scoring for receivers is extremely volatile so the fact that Julio is so consistent in those other categories it's like you can't um you, it's impossible to knock him any any lower down than like the wide receiver four or five at, at the latest but the other thing is, like, we haven't heard anything about this whole foot thing. We know that he's, like, sitting out because of a foot thing, but it could be related to his contract extension. He's always dealing with a foot problem. So, so we hear it's, like, actually something serious other than what we've just been hearing for the last five years. Then I, I'm not going to be looking at that with any sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, when those, like, when older – he's not an older player, but, like, for a receiver who, with that type of athleticism, I guess you could say, what is he, 30 years old now? Oh, we got some breaking news real quick. No, don't be Julio or Melvin. No, no, it's, it's nothing relevant. Oh, not good. that relevant. Dr. Justin Morris just tweeted out. So if anyone has listened to me over the past few years, you know my thoughts on knee and hamstring injuries. Redskins Darius Geis just suffered a hamstring injury. And this is like what we've been fucking preaching all summer is that these other injuries, there's a lot of players coming off of injuries this recent year. And Darius Geis had his ACL torn early in the, in, in the preseason – but he had a three-month pushback of the surgery. So his surgery, because um, this, sorry, I, uh, never mind. It's all good. Um, I just texted somebody too. I'm guilty. Okay. I thought, I was like, <laughs> you texting me? Um, 
So this surgery is pushed back three months. So basically it, it's, it's, it's the same thing as tearing his ACL, you know, three months into the season. And we have guys like Cooper Cup. We have guys like Will Fuller who all had surgery like in November for the torn ACLs. When you, you know, you can watch all the fucking Instagram videos you want, all the Twitter videos you want of a guy making cuts. And I'm not even referring to your Emmanuel Sanders show today. <laughs> that was beautiful. Don't even Tell disrespect that. He did look really fucking good. I'm still <laughs> off the train. But guys who tear their ACLs and you see these Instagram videos, it doesn't fucking mean anything. That literally means nothing because these guys are probably pushing themselves. We know from science, from facts, that these nine to 12 month return timetables are a thing. You don't get to surpass them because you looked good on Instagram. These are a thing. When you start pushing yourself too quickly, it suffers in other areas. Hence what happened to Darius guys. I would put a hundred dollars on it. The fact that that infection or whatever pushed the surgery back three months. And now he's pushing himself too hard leading to the hamstring injury. So he's almost fucking off the, he's almost on the do not draft list completely now. I, yeah. I like anywhere near in, in the single digit rounds. And he's a 230 plus pound back or like around that range. And Leonard Fournette last year, we saw do absolutely nothing once he started dealing with those hamstring injuries. And as you said, if he keeps pushing himself with a hamstring injury, that's something that could linger and not to like bring this up or whatever, but didn't Adrian Peterson said he's in a flirt with 2000 rushing yards this year. I mean, yeah, I, I kind of fucking believe him. I don't, I don't doubt I, anything that comes out of AP's mouth. Maybe he was, respect. maybe he was like Darius Geis's personal trainer, just trying to get him out this year. So who, who knows what happened? Yeah, yeah. I Stay mean, woke. That, that, it doesn't sound like a big fact. It sounds like a big, <laughs> big a big thought. But I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't knock the finesse from from AP's camp if that's if that's the case. But again, guys, like this, when when you have the torn ACL mid season, there's two ways it goes. You push yourself too early and you re injure yourself. Or you take it slow and you do the, the correct recovery timetable, but that also means that you are sacrificing being at full strength for a majority of the season and you don't produce at the level that people think you should be producing at 100% health because you're not at 100% health, even though that's the right thing over the long term. Let's get back to the wide receivers. Um, Julio, the touchdown, as you said, don't scare you. It's going to be a high-powered offense. Dirk Cutter's going to throw the ball 70% of the time. Um, there is like this little thing in the back of my mind that I am scared about this foot just overall, not from this little report, obviously that just came out because there's nothing really behind it substantially. I, I feel like the, I can understand why people don't want to take Julio just because his mix of not touchdown scoring and, and the foot and ankle issues and shit that he's dealt with are, um, are a concern, but it's fucking Julio Jones. He's just done it so many years in a row that it's hard to argue against him. Yeah, 99% of the leagues aren't drafted right now. So by the time like August 30th or whenever you draft rolls around, this foot injury will probably – it'll either be cleared up as good or bad, and you can kind of revise these thoughts from there. Um, another thing you brought up about the touchdowns, I'm going to bring up a tweet about Pat, that Pat Thorman put out and actually thought it was pretty interesting. So over the first nine weeks, Julio Jones saw three red zone targets, and he didn't catch any of them. Over the last eight, he had the most red zone targets in the league with 14 – most red zone yards with 100, and touchdowns with five. So he was finally starting to be used. And I think the, like, the common narrative around him was, yeah, he was being either, yes, he's being used, but he's not effective, or no, he wasn't being used at all. We see now with these numbers that he, when he was being used, he was effective, and he was like the best wide receiver in the league in that area of the field over the second half of the year. And if they continue that into this year, um, what year was Dirk Cutter? with him 2014 it was 2012 to 2014 and I went back to dive in really fucking deep to figure out like deep ball percentages red zone percentages and Julio's numbers were completely fucking the same with their cutter without their mm -hmm. cutter in terms of target share in the red zone 10 zone target share deep ball percentage target share um the only difference between the three years with cutter and the and three four years without were his uh like touchdowns on deep throws which are uh -huh. I don't this, the volume was still there. So I was trying to dig in to find like, oh, can we expect more red zone looks with their cutter there? I don't think that's the case. The problem becomes with like, that's a great staff from Pat Thorman, but it's like, do, do we, does that mean that they're going to continue to use Julio in the red zone? Yeah. Uh, at a yeah, high volume. Too predictable. Consistently do that, you know? Yeah. I just, that was kind of like a random thought of mine about Dirk Cutter, but I just remember he scored 10 touchdowns like once in his career and it was earlier on. And that was with Dirk Cutter, but that was, I don't, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know if they came in the red zone, as you just said, they were mostly on deep attempts. So. Yeah, exactly. But the yeah. volume, like he's, he got the same number of deep targets with and without. So it's just like, it, it's just a matter of luck that he happened to have touchdowns on some of them and, and not touchdowns on other ones, you know? Yeah, he's probably, other than the top two, the safest receiver in the league because he's been top five three of the past four years. And the one it's year like, he wasn't, he was number six. I know, dude. It's fucked up because he has probably the safest floor in terms of just raw production. 
Like, if we saw one fucking year out of him where he exploded for 15 touchdowns, you would just be like, he has the safest floor and by far and away the highest ceiling. You know, like, yeah. we just need to see that one year. But he's been in the league for so fucking long that it just seems like we're not going to ever see that big touchdown year out of him. And I'm not going to bet on that happening this year. I would say, you know, in the 8 to 10 range is probably – or you know, maybe 6 to 10 range is probably realistic. But he's going to – he has a floor of 85 catches and probably 1,500 yards. So can't knock you for, for taking Julio there. Even at his age, he's not really a concern anywhere else yeah and if we want to move on to Michael Thomas um, we already touched on his teammate Alvin Kamara and I already spit some knowledge and you know I think that this team is going to be moving more towards <laughs> more towards a running attack with the investment in their defense and also bringing in Latavius Murray and that kind of that kind of worries me because you've already said that Drew Brees kind of felt not fell off towards the second half of the year like throughout the whole year he wasn't as good and he wasn't the same Drew Brees that we've come to expect um, and you look at Michael Thomas's stats for the first half and the second half of the year, and it kind of shows that, right? Because over the second half of the year, he, sure, he was on pace for 136 targets. That's really good. But that's a lot less than the pace he was on over the first half, which was 158. And his yardage total, he was on pace for 1,000 yards over the last eight games of the season. And mm-hmm. that's not only a function of Drew Brees falling off, but it's also them trying to dominate time and possession and trying to move the ball on the ground more. I'm just not sure with how they're building this team that Michael Thomas – has the upside of the number one wide receiver in fantasy where I think the other four guys in this tier do. No, I actually don't. I don't think he has the upside of the number one, the number one overall wide receiver at all. But I think his floor is, is, you know, that his floor is what gets him into this tier without a doubt, because he's one of the most talented wide receivers in the league without question. But this offense doesn't take a lot of shots downfield because they don't need to. The rest of their offense is so fucking efficient and so good. And their defense, like you said, has been improving year over year. And, If they take another step forward, this overall team is going to be very good. They don't need to take chances down the field. They don't need to take shots, especially with Breeze's arm lacking a little bit of strength as he gets older. And I saw you tweet out the other day about his splits, like first half or second half. And I tweeted out something about him weeks one through three versus weeks um, four through 17. He had the same number. So 100 plus yard receiving games, double digit target games, double digit receiving game or double digit reception games, and then fantasy points of 17 and a half or more games. He had the same number of all those categories in weeks one through three as he did for the remaining 13 weeks of the season. He was just simply, he was good. He was a wide receiver one over those next 13 weeks, but he was nowhere near having that ceiling of elite wide receiver ones. And, you know, like I'm not going to be mad whatsoever if Michael Thomas drops to me in this tier and he's the last one I pick in this tier and I get him on my fantasy team because his floor is phenomenal. The way I look at it though, he's not, he doesn't have league winning upside. Like I think these other three guys do. Um, So Michael Thomas safe. I don't think he has a ceiling there. I think Odell though does have the ceiling. Yeah. Odell. You want to go? All right. I was just going to say Odell is probably, you can make the case for like at this point in his career is the most talented of these receivers. The only issue is if he can stay on the field and for all we know right now, he's healthy. And that's the only way we can make this analysis. And I'll put up the sports injury predictor. They actually project him to miss seven games this year. And I know, uh, you, scary, yeah. yeah, you brought uh, Dr. Jesse Morse on the channel. What did he say? Did he give any thoughts about he this? He loves Odell. He, he's not nervous about an Odell injury at all. So that's why I'm so conflicted because, you know, some people think it is. That's the, that's the thing that scares me the most. But I also think that – I actually think what's going to happen, the most likely outcome, is that he stays on the field or at least plays 14 or 15 games – and we're going to look back and he's going to have an absolute fucking monster year. And we're going to be like, fuck, it was right. Like all, like it, all the writings on the wall, he moved from Eli to Baker Mayfield. Like, how did we not see this coming? Like, why were we not more in on Odell? I think, I think realistically that's what's probably going to happen. So I am getting a little bit um, hotter on Odell and I, I will be targeting Odell in a couple of my drafts. If I play in five season long leagues, I'm, he's 100% going to be on my team. I already know this no matter where I'm drafted from. He will be on my team in one league because I really think, um, that injury is my biggest concern for him, for sure, because he, he hasn't really proven to stay healthy. And I remember in the beginning of his career, too. like He started, he started off, off hurt. I remember one of my fantasy Odell. leagues, somebody actually drafted him. like, who the hell is this Odell Beckham Jr. guy? And he so rattled off like 900 yard games in a row. That. Yeah, like that would never happen nowadays. You know what I mean? Like this year, <laughs> doing like the rookie wide receivers, like you would know all about Odell and you would probably have loved him, like watching him play and shit. Um, yeah, Odell does concern me because he's dealt with a lot of fucking injuries. And what's, the reason I am, am also getting hired is because Dr. Morse was the one who told people to stay away from him going into, like, he coming off that um, 
one year, I forget whatever it was when he like shattered his ankle or whatever. He was like, that was against the Chargers. He got rolled up on his ankle, like fucking snapped. Yeah. He was like, stay away from him because of whatever was happening prior to it. And he called it like spot on. And now he's flipping and he's like, I love Odell this year. So now I'm like, fuck, like I, I maybe I shouldn't be as concerned with an Odell injury. And if like, if, if Odell's on the field with Baker Mayfield, them two are going to make fucking magic. You know, there's no, there's no way that he just doesn't explode and have a monster year. Cause Baker's one of the most accurate, and high volume deep ball passers. He was third in deep ball pass attempts per game per PFF. And I believe he was also third in terms of accuracy. Yeah, 51.4%. Only behind Drew Brees and Mariota. And Mariota had a ton less attempts. So he's getting the volume and he's also really like good on those attempts. And if yeah. Odell is going to have Baker Mayfield throwing him the ball deep instead of Eli Manning, yeah. he could catch like five balls of plus 50, like 50 plus yards this year. And if I know that's why I'm 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 at the eight pick in the E-Town Get Down League, and I think I might start off Devontae Adams and Odell Beckham if Odell falls to me, and I think Snacks is going to be one of the people in between. So there's no way he takes him in one of the one of his two picks. Oh, so he's off him now because he I, left. I think he just hates Odell. Yeah, I think it's like a personal thing now, and he doesn't want to root for him, so he won't take yeah. him, and that just leaves one other person. So at the 12 spot, I'll end up. I'll probably I'm trying to get Devontae Adams, assuming we don't know what, what happens with Melvin Gordon, but if Gordon falls to me, I'll probably take him with the one and then go wide receiver heavy the rest of the fucking draft. But if he doesn't, and I have to take – I have to take, like I said, it's a bad thing. Like, Adams <laughs> at the eight, and then it's a 10-team league, so it's obviously a lot easier. But another one of these elite wide receivers will fall to me at, at the 12 spot, and I'll be happy going with those three – or those two off the bat and uh, having them as, like, a staple because they're all – everyone here is so safe and has yeah. great fucking ceiling, man. And you don't get that with uh, a lot of the running backs. In the, yeah, the and, a, and a negative for Odell could possibly be the fact that people bring up that uh, Baker Mayfield likes to spread the ball around a lot. Jarvis Landry saw 149 targets last year, and he's nowhere near the receiver that Odell is. And he's going to be running – if he sees a 25% target share this year on last year's volume, and I know it might go down a little bit because they moved a little bit heavier towards the run – a 25% target share, which isn't out of the like, isn't unlikely for him, is 153 targets. I think, I, I think targets. it's unlikely because he's probably going to see like 29% of the targets. Yeah, I'm just being a little like generously low. 25% brings 153 targets to him. And last year, he was on pace for 165 targets, and his receiving line would have been 100 catches, 1,400 yards, 8 touchdowns, and that's with Eli. So he plays there, were so many horrid, there were so many horrid throws from Eli last year, too. Like, his numbers – that's what I mean. Like, we're looking at it, and everyone can, I think, objectively be like – he, uh, Odell is probably the most talented wide receiver, maybe arguably a, a few, you know, Antonio or, or DeAndre Hopkins just from a raw skill set. But like o Odell is probably the most talented raw gifted athlete. And now we're moving it over to one of the best young quarterbacks in the league. So I, I really think we're going to look back and just be like, it was, it was the writing was on the wall and uh, we, we just started looking too deep into the numbers and it was just, you know, sometimes fantasy football does not have to be hard. You know, give me one second. Can you hear my dog barking right now? A little bit, yeah. He's getting fucking fired up with all the big facts getting dropped on big facts. All right, I'll, I'll cut this out then. The you can't really actually hear it that much, to be honest. Let's all right, the yeah, the UPS guy just flew by. Um, my rankings of these four, I've got Julio as my one. I got Juju at two, OBJ at three, and Michael Thomas at four. Okay, I, 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 uh, I'm going to go with Julio as the one, Odell as the two, Juju as the three, and Michael Thomas as the four. And I yeah. think those top three guys for me are very, 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 very close. And I would say Michael Thomas is easily my fourth. But that doesn't mean I, I hate the guy. I just don't think he has anywhere near the upside of, of the guys in front of him. Yeah. And I'm going to be honest. I think if – all right, I'm going to fucking mute this. I'll cut this out. I think yeah. I think I left off saying um, what my opinions on my top four. I think Juju and OBJ are extremely close for me. And I think, honestly, a little bit of bias will play into it as like the off season goes along. And I think I could easily see myself putting OBJ two or maybe even ahead of Julio. If we just see like those videos on Twitter, I might, I might fall victim to that just because I think Odell is an awesome player. We're going to see a, a ton of really good videos from camp at Cleveland, I think with Odell and they're going to look really good. And then he's going to fucking move up to like the wide receiver three. And I, I think it'll be people drafting him as a wide receiver one this year too, just because yeah. I don't know. It's just him and Baker are just going to make fucking magic. But let's move on to this third tier, uh, which is the tight ends, the third or second tier of tight ends. Before we do that, though, um, if you're enjoying the video so far, if you're finding it informational or valuable in whatever sense, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. It let's YouTube know that we're doing a good job and let us know you appreciate us. And, um, and that's it. And make sure you're following us on Twitter because we're always throwing out random shit on there that you're not going to be finding in these YouTube videos. 
Tight end tier number two. Who do you have in this tier, first of all, before we break them down? I got OJ Howard, Hunter Henry, and Evan Ingram. Correct. That is a correct answer. So those three <laughs> are coming off the board. I'd say Kelsey's in his own tier, and then Ertz and Kittle, however you want to order them. I have Kittle over Ertz. But this tier, I think this tier could possibly be a make-or-break tier as well because the tight end position is just so fucking top-heavy. But if you can get your hands on someone who actually breaks into that tier without having to spend that tier capital on it, like that's going to give you such a fucking big boost um, for this stuff. So the way I look at it is like I really like O.J. Howard. My concern was, was his, um, his health. And after talking to Dr. Morse, he is not concerned about it. Because when we look at he didn't have injury concerns at all in Alabama. He was always healthy in Alabama. And then he noticed a pattern that at the end of the year, both years, it was his, uh, I forget what foot, it, what side of the foot it was, but you're seeing the same, a lower leg injury in the same foot, your same ankle or whatever. And it seems like he loses a little bit of stamina at the end of the year, right? And it's just something that he needs to work on, like conditioning wise. So the way I look at it, it's it kind of like how we talked about James Conner. Like, is that something that happens when he wears down at the end of the year? So OJ Howard low-key might be fucking incredible for the first 10, 12 weeks. And then maybe you look to trade him right before your trade deadline because we know, or we don't, maybe, maybe we don't know, but it's, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it's not, uh, that he probably wears down towards the end of the year. So he can give you an amazing bunch of weeks and then you can maybe flip him for someone, someone else, whatever. But um, point being is like OJ Howard was so consistent last year. I think in the nine games he played, you're gonna have to fact check me on this. I believe he went over 50 receiving yards in like seven or eight of the nine games. And you don't get that sort of consistency out of most fantasy tight ends. And we have Adam Humphreys leaving. We have Deshaun Jackson leaving. And those are two different types of targets. Those are long range targets. And those are short over the middle targets, both which a tight end gets, right? He'll take those Adam Humphreys targets, but he's also a great seam stretcher down the field. And I think um, that's where some of those Sean Jackson targets will go. Some to Mike Evans, some to him, some to Chris Godwin, whatever. Uh, I I think O.J. Howard is in for an absolute breakout year. So I I like O.J. a lot. Yeah, just to fact check you, I don't know what you said, but it was probably right. He uh, hit 50 receiving yards or more in eight of 10 games. And one of those games, he played like 25% of the snaps and saw three targets. And then the other thing, with those two receivers gone, that's 179 targets. They're not all going to go to him. But I don't think they're all going – like a bunch of them are going to go to Godwin and Evans either because – well, more so Evans, because Evans already saw, I think, 139 targets last year. If he goes up to, like, the 160 mark, that's only, like, 21 more targets. Um, I could see maybe Chris Godden getting 30. Even if they both get 30 apiece, that's 119 targets left over. O.J. Howard was on pace for 77 last year. The reason why I put him ahead of the other two guys is because I think he has the upside of Evan Ingram in the fact that he's going to have probably close to as many targets as Ingram. But he also has the benefit of playing on a good offense like Hunter Henry. So he brings the upside of both of the two guys in the tier with him. And I wouldn't be surprised if he finishes in the range of a Kittle or Ertz this year because everything's kind of working in his way if he stays healthy. He's one of the most efficient tight ends in the league. Um, he's really athletic. He's young. He's on a high-powered offense that wants to throw the ball a ton. They're probably going to be in a bunch of scoring positions. So he's easily my number one out of these three tight ends. I hate that Cameron Brate is still on that team. Um, my one concern for OJ is that, like, he's always been proven to be super efficient. And Jameis Winston loves throwing to the tight ends, but he uses camera rates so much in the red zone area. And I don't know if OJ Howard, like, I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if he finished up with there with Kittle and Ertz, but I think both of them have like a target floor of 120 targets. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm nervous to even say that that's like OJ Howard's ceiling. Like, is he going to hit 125 targets this year? Like, probably not, you know? And that's where it's like, that's the delta between does he reach that tier or not. And I think it'll, it's purely based on volume because he's good enough athletically and he's efficient enough on his targets to explode and have those major breakout games that will put him into that tier. But does he get the volume? That's, that's like my only concern with him. Yeah, I don't think he touches 120 just because I, I, this offense, I'm not sure they're going to throw the ball as much as they did last year, even though they're going to be a high-powered offense. It's just kind of ridiculous how much they threw it last year. Um, if, I think even if he sees 100 to 110 targets, his efficiency will probably still be there because he's proven it two years in a row. Yeah. Just, I made this thing. It was on my bold prediction. I wrote it up just using his career catch percentage yards per catch and touchdown percentage, which is I used as touchdowns divided by receptions on a hundred targets. His pace would be 69 catches, 1145 yards and 11 touchdowns. And in no way am I saying that's like his floor. That's probably near his ceiling, but I think that his ceiling percentage, give him 11 touchdowns there. 
Yeah, well, I, I don't know how you calculate it. I did touchdowns over receptions. Probably touchdowns over targets is probably a more accurate way to do it. But I mean, either way, it's the same ratio, depending yeah. on how you fucking – Well, yeah, his rookie year, he didn't catch many balls, and he caught a lot of touchdowns. So um, yeah, that would probably go down. Small sample size. But, yeah, I mean, you look at the top three guys. Ertz had 156 targets last year. Kelsey, 150. Kittle, 135. And then you drop it down to Ebron, 110. Jared Cook, 100. Like, I think O.J. Howard is probably more likely to finish in that 95 or 90 to 110 range than he is to finish near the um, – than the numbers that, like, Ertz, Kelsey, and, and Kill saw, you know, 140 to 150. And that, you know, in itself, like, if, he's, if, if you're telling me he's going to get 15 to 20 less targets, you can't reasonably expect him to finish as an elite tier. But if you get a guy that you know is going to be the tight end four, like, two rounds later or three rounds later than the rest of these guys, that's still a, a fantastic fucking investment. Um, and then, you know, speaking of these other two tight ends, investing in them will probably cost you, uh, I'd say like a six round pick. I believe that's yeah. about when they're pick number 60 overall for Hunter Henry pick 64 for Ingram. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people really like Ingram and I'm having a hard time buying into the narrative because again, like with Barkley, it's just, just a bad team. And I know Ingram is a guy who's not really going to eat based off his touchdown totals because he's an athletic playmaker that stretches the seam. But his rookie year, I mean, he had a ton of volume, and that was by default because everyone was hurt, and that's why he kind of blew up. So, like, I think Evan Ingram has a good floor because he's going to be such a big piece of this offense, but I don't really like his ceiling that much. And I think Hunter Henry has double-digit touchdown, uh, like, potential. That's definitely in his range of outcomes, if not, like, 12 touchdowns, you know? Yeah. Me personally, I just think between Henry and Ingram, if we're going to bring up that, like, dichotomy or whatever, I think between the two, I kind of prefer Ingram because – I could see him out targeting Hunter Henry by like 30 targets this year. I'm just not sure what the Chargers plan is. If Melvin Gordon stays around, I think this team just stays as a like a more run heavy team going into this year. And with Mike, the last time we saw Hunter Henry on the field, Mike Williams wasn't who he is now. And he's a red zone beast. He's going to be a guy who's going to command targets. And Keenan Allen, despite him not being like a jump ball athlete or the biggest guy in the field, he gets a lot of, I think he's had 39 red zone targets over the past two years. And when Hunter Henry was on the Hunter Henry was on the field, um, the two years he was there, one year, Keenan Allen was out pretty much the entire year, and then the other year they had no Mike Williams. So I'm not sure if his red zone usage and his touchdown upside is as high as it was heading into last year, where I know both of us were extremely high on him. You know what I like about Henry though? I I, I think his floor each week is like really nice, and I appreciate that in like a mid round uh, tight end because. When you try to go late round tight end and you get cute waiting on them, that rarely works out. You end up getting three points a fucking game from those streaming tight ends. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to spend the draft capital on a top tight end, you're you're usually left with an inconsistent player. And I feel like we're going to get that out of Evan Ingram just because this offense is going to be so wildly inconsistent where they're probably going to have, you know, like five games where they put up 13 or fewer points. Um, and that just means the offense is probably not driving down the field. So, yeah, you're right. Like Evan Ingram could very possibly end up with like 20 or 30 more targets than Hunter Henry. But I think Hunter Henry is going to give you like a, a good like five for 50 as a floor almost week in and week out. And if he does score the touchdowns, then that's going to put him in that, you know, top four uh, kind of range. So I value Henry more just because I, I really like the, the safety, the consistency, I should say, that he gives you week in and week out. Because he's going to be a very uh, a primary target of this passing game. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the same thing we brought up with Barkley where this offense is kind of the main reason we're against Ingram because even last year in the beginning of the year, he was really inconsistent. I don't know the numbers in front of me. Towards the end of the year, he actually did really well, but I remember at the beginning of the season, people were like dropping him and then they had to pick him up off waiver wire because yeah. it's just not a great offense and I'm not sure many people outside of Saquon Barkley can produce. And, you know, I, I'm listening to what you're saying and these two guys are really close for me. I just think if I'm going to spend a, like a six-round pick on one of these two guys, I'd rather get the guy who's going a little bit later and just have more volume unless like if a guy in the charge get if uh, Melvin Gordon doesn't come back next year I think it's a huge bump up to Hunter Henry because they use the running back so heavily in the red zone they targeted them like 28 percent of the time and he's obviously a big part of that offense but if he comes back I'm just not sure what his ceiling is in this offense yeah um, I mean if you're if I know that I'm going to be able to get Ingram in the seventh and Henry in the sixth I'm going to take uh, Ingram in the seventh. I, I will wait the round and take a, a solid player for my team in the sixth round. I just, I wouldn't feel confident, you know, skipping on him just because like, I think the value, like, I feel like if you skip both guys in the sixth, there's a good chance that you end up getting neither. And I don't know if I want to take that chance. So if I'm going straight up. I'd rather have Henry, but you know, again, like you said, like Ingram finished really strong down the stretch last year, his last four games, weeks 14 through 17, three catches, 77 yards, eight catches, 75 yards, six catches, 87 yards, five catches, 81 yards and a touchdown. 
Like, if that's the numbers we're going to get, he's going to finish as an elite tight end. And that's great. But at the same time, I'm pretty sure Odell missed all of those games to end the year. Um, and they really didn't have much else in the passing game. So, uh, he again, it might be looking at it, like, from the rookie year where he was just thrust into a role where there was no one else, no targets. And now you have Shepard and you have Tate there. And um, they could try to go run heavy with an improved offensive line and just getting Barkley more involved through the ground and try to c- control the clock for whatever reason. Um, because like, I can't imagine them trying to give the ball to Eli. Like they saw what Eli was last year and they can't have the, they can't, it wasn't good. They can't have a game plan to fucking throw the ball 35 times a game. That is like the the easiest game plan in order to lose whatever the fuck you're doing. You know what I mean? So I just, I don't know. This offense scares me too much to invest uh, a top six or seven round pick in the passing offense. So, I mean, Ingram's right there with Henry. I'll, I'll take Henry over him though. So for me, it's OJ, Henry, Ingram. Yeah, just in a vacuum, based on like what I think, I think those three is the right order. But for me, I would take Ingram. I'd put Ingram not ahead of him, but I think I'd be more likely to uh, select him instead of Henry and maybe even O.J. Howard because O.J. Howard's going pick 50 and you can get him a whole round later. Um, just because I think he has a similar floor, maybe not as high of a ceiling, but you can get a, like a really good tier two tight end at a later pick uh, in comparison to these two. And even if you're feeling a little skeptical about Henry and Ingram, you might just pass on that tier as a whole, wait a couple rounds, get a guy like Eric Ebron, and instead of picking a guy like Engram, get a guy like Calvin Ridley, who if, yeah. you, uh, if you want a wide receiver, just the opportunity cost thing right there. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting tier. I, I mean, I think all three guys are good picks. I think they all have relatively solid floors and ceilings, and hopefully that holds true because for so long we just didn't have tight ends in the middle tier that really did anything for you. Um, but hopefully that's not the case this year. And uh, that's going to wrap up the video for today again if y'all enjoyed the video always hit that thumbs up button subscribe to the channel if you're new we're doing this every week on tuesday make sure you're following at fb dot on twitter and we will be giving away one draft guide to scratch that follower. i will be giving away two draft guides well i'll give away two then fuck it we'll give away two draft guides all i have to do is literally just put their email in the system you don't have i was to gonna pay for it i was gonna have you like actually do it. yeah you don't have to do that don't worry damn um, <laughs> we'll, we'll pretend it's your next paycheck then <laughs> Just made sixty dollars. All right. So that's going to be watching right now, anyways. It's all right. Yeah, facts. No one even joined for this long. If you if you did join for this long, you stuck around for this long. Drop a comment down below, and maybe I maybe I'll give you a draft guide just because you stuck around for this long. That's it. We're out. Goodbye. It's-